If you don't have a sermon outline, please lift your hand and these kind gentlemen will give one to you. The way we study the Bible in our church, it will be very helpful, especially with a long passage that we have this morning. You will need a sermon outline. Maybe you're new to us this morning. Just lift your hand up and these guys will give one to you. I love the narrative of the gospel. When we come to Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, and we see the life of the Lord Jesus, we see his interactions with individuals, we learn much from him. Now, in all the life of our church, we study both the Old Testament, we've studied the book of Hosea, we've looked at various Psalms, and we've looked at various places of the Old Testament scriptures, and we've read a lot of the New Testament letters as well. We've studied Titus, we've studied Jude, we are in the midst of studying Philippians. But this morning, on this special Sunday before Thanksgiving, we want to come back to the Gospels. And uh, when we come to the book of Luke, Luke chapter 7, we see a woman who is only described as a woman of great sin, of many sins, a sinful woman. And we see her life, we see her narrative in this, just a moment, a snapshot of it, and we see a picture of the juxtaposition between a Pharisee and a sinful woman. And in this, we see the source of gr true gratitude. So this morning, you have your outline there. Look with me in Luke chapter 7 and verse 36. I want to read this short story, and there is so much here. I pray that you will allow God's Word to speak to your heart that we will gain from this greatly, have a pen in hand ready to mark things as we go. Notice the title that I put above the box. It says, The Gratitude of a Sinful Woman Forgiven. So she is a sinful woman that is forgiven, and we see her gratitude. In verse 36, one of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him, speaking of Jesus. One of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him. And he went into the Pharisee's house and reclined at table. And behold, a woman of the city, underline it, who was a sinner. Now you'd say, aren't all of us sinners? Isn't, doesn't Romans 3.23 says, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Doesn't Isaiah tell us there is none righteous, no, not one, absolutely. But when the New Testament, in its language of describing different ways in the society of, of, of expression, when you call someone a sinner, it means, okay, they're a sinner, one that is publicly known for their sin. So, who was a sinner, when she learned that he was reclining at table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of ointment, verse 38, and standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears and wipe them with the hair of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with ointment. So I want you to kind of have the picture that is here. It's as if Jesus is reclining and his feet are behind him. He has the table in front of him. So that's, that's why it says that she was behind him. Do you understand that? And so his feet are behind it. They, they didn't have upright chairs like we have uh, typically at, at dining place. And you would say, oh, how uncomfortable. Well, not that bad. They usually had pretty good cushions, pretty good things. They would, they would come, and it, it allowed for a very intimate gathering around a low table. So there, as they had met, here she presses in. And while behind him, she is weeping, and weeping such copious tears that she would, that she would wash his feet with her tears and dry them with her hair. Truly something that no one in that room had likely ever seen before. So notice with me as we go on in verse 39. Now, when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to him, if this man were a prophet, he said to himself, so he's saying this to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what sort of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. I love this. Verse 40, and Jesus answering said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. So <laughs> he wanted to make sure that Simon knew, I'm not saying this to the crowd. 
I know what was in your heart. I know what you were thinking. You see, to God, He knows our thoughts before they come out of our lips. And Jesus answering said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he answered, say it, teacher. Verse 41. A certain money lender had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. When they could not pay, he canceled the debt of both. Now, which of them would love him more? Verse 43, Simon, that's the name of the Pharisee. Simon answered, the one, I suppose, for whom he canceled the larger debt. And he said to him, you have judged rightly. Then turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house, and you gave me no water for my feet, but she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not ceased to kiss my feet. And you did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore, I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But he who is forgiven little loves little. Verse 48, and he said to her, your sins are forgiven. Then those who were at the table with him began to say among themselves, who is this? Who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. In this glorious passage, we see a proud Pharisee of ingratitude. And we see a sinful woman with deep gratitude. And we see in this passage that the Lord Jesus is making a point of where gratitude comes from. That's the glorious picture of this, is that we're being shown where it comes from. Now, if we if we are wise, we will look at the, the current situation of the, of the human race. In our fallen state of sin, we are, we are prone toward ingratitude. In fact, we have an introductory premise here. That I want you to notice this and fill this in. Ingratitude is a growing problem in our world today. Now, it's been a, been a, it's been a growing problem for this entire age, for this entire epoch. It's been a growing problem for 2,000 years in this regard. But here we see that the further we run from biblical truth, the more ungrateful we become. And we can even say that in American society today. The more we forget the recent heritage of the last 250, 300 years of a biblical value, a biblical knowledge of the gospel, the more we leave the heritage that we were given, in fact, that to some degree we celebrate it this week from the pilgrims and the, the beauty of co- them coming to seek uh, religious freedom and worship God as their conscience would dictate and as God's Word would say was their motivation to come to this land. The, the state church of England and the state churches of Europe were, were prohibiting them from worshiping with a clear conscience. And so that would be the very reason that the Mayflower would come with William Bradford and the others that were, that were coming seeking this freedom. And so we, we come to this picture that, that while we've been a nation adrift, we are running now headlong away from biblical truth. And the further we get from biblical truth, the more ungrateful we become. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. Prophetically, we see that Paul is saying to Timothy what this is going to be, and it describes the spirit of our present age. Look what it says in verse 1. But understand this, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty, for people will become lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents. There it is, circle it ungrateful. Now, this is just one, but look at the others. Ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, 
without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than, rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness but denying its power. Now, I I don't know of more appropriate verses that describe the current culture, not just of America, but of the developed Western world. We are running headlong at these things, and we see a growing coldness of people's hearts, and we see a growing ingratitude. Notice this here. Our society's wealth and distraction from spiritual need contributes to our ingratitude. So the the wealthier we become, we become not more grateful, but we become less grateful. The things of this world become a distraction to the things that are truly most important, the eternal things, the spiritual things. Notice the next point. Ingratitude is a thing, and it's a thing among pagans, and even worse, among religionists. You say, what's a religionist? A religionist is is part of what we see here with the Pharisee. It's part of what we, in fact, we even use that term in our modern culture. We say, oh, the guy has a pharisaical attitude about that. We would say a very self-righteous attitude about that. He has a religious standard or he he has a certain standard for something, but yet he himself is ingenuine in that. In the life of our church, we talk a lot about the difference between religion and relationship, that cultural Christianity pushes religion, 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 much like Islam, much like Hinduism, much like all of the other world religions. It's all about what you do. It's not about what Christ has done. And so the religionist can think very highly of himself and think that he's better than everyone else, And therefore, in the process of that, becomes very ungrateful. You see, as I've been praying about this and thinking about this this week, I wanted to make this statement to you. Ingratitude is not merely the absence of gratitude, but it's the presence of attitudes that are contrary to to gratitude. And so, it's, it's the presence of arrogance it's the idea that I did this. It's, it's that I have this because of me. Or maybe it's the attitude of entitlement. I deserve this. And so instead of being grateful with the blessings that we have, being grateful the things that are given to us, being grateful for these, these things in our life that are, that are all around us, we, we begin to think, well, I deserve this. Everybody gets this. Or the attitude of greed. I want more. I desire more. So what you have is not enough. It has to do with the insatiable nature of a, of a heart that lusts after the things of the world. You see, so, so this, this isn't just merely not grateful, but in place of not being grateful is all of these other attitudes that, that cause this, that reveal a sinful heart. You see, ingratitude flows from no sense of inner need. Fill that in. Ingratitude flows from no sense of inner need. It's, it's I'm self-sufficient. I've done this. I am entitled to this, or I simply want more. It's all the stuff on the outside. It's not the need on the inside. So that's the introductory problem that we see dealing with the Pharisee. But, but look at the bottom phrase that is here, and this is very important because this is when we flip the sheet, this is where we go. Notice that the Scripture premise is this, is that true gratitude flows from faith, grace, and forgiveness. This is where a truly grateful heart finds the deepest gratitude that the human soul can experience. 
flip the sheet and let's look and break down this passage. As we often do, we, we study passages seeking to look at what is in the text and pull out of what is in the text um, the truths that, that the text is showing to us. And so in the life of this story, same passage right here in a, in a long column here so we can look and see some key things that come out of this. First of all, I want you to see what we've just said. Ingratitude roots from no sense of need. When you think about a tree and its roots, and that tree sends down roots down deep into the ground, and that is, that is the anchor of the tree. That is from where it draws um, its sustenance. So, so that's, that's what's there. So what feeds ingratitude? That which feeds ingratitude is no sense of need. It, it, it's the, the idea that you don't have a spiritual need, that you are self-sufficient in this. If you would, circle up there Simon the Pharisee. Simon the Pharisee is the first subject that we look at. Simon the Pharisee has no sense of felt need for God's grace. He, he thinks he's a pretty good guy. In fact, when he compares himself to all of the other people in Israel, and he compares himself to the other people in Jerusalem and many of his friends, he has the typical pharisaical attitude of a group of people that were religionists, that it was all about a point system, and it was all about, it was all about status, and it was all about who is more holy than who. And there were many different sects of this, but the Pharisees were known and powerful and saw, sought um, or, or viewed by the society as being very holy. But notice what we learn from this. Look in verse 36. One of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him, and he went into the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. The first thing I want us to notice is that ingratitude reacts to Christ with incorrect motivation. It, it, it reacts to Christ with incorrect motivation. This is, this is what happens. So, Simon the Pharisee has seen Jesus, he's listened to Jesus, and he invites him to come to the house. Now, we don't know exactly what all his motivations were, but we know what some of them were not, and that's what we see in the text in how he treated Jesus. In fact, we're going to see that he treated Jesus very poorly. And so, we, it begs to wonder if he wasn't treating Jesus well, if he, wasn't, he, if he wasn't warmly welcoming him, and if he wasn't even doing the most basic things of hospitality of the day, then what were his motivations for coming? Was it to be seen with Jesus? Was it that, oh yeah, you know, I had that new preacher over to my house, yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah, you know, association, he sees Jesus getting a following. Is that what it is? We, do, we don't see him asking many questions. We don't see him coming to, to learn and listen. In fact, we, we see this. Maybe, maybe there was a little bit of curiosity. You can fill this in. Curiosity without commitment does not mean gratitude because there, there wasn't any commitment. What about social pandering? He, you know, it's a social thing to do. You know, that's, that's why some people come to church. Maybe some people come out of curiosity. What is this about? What do you mean? I'm intrigued by this. But there's no commitment. And so there's no gratitude. Or as we see here, social pandering. You know, some people come to church because, you know, well, it's a thing to do. And, and the, the people are nice. And, you know, it's a, it's a social thing. And it's good for business. So there's not, there's not truly any spiritual need that's there. You see, Simon shows no sign of spiritual motivation. He doesn't show any sign in all of this of spiritual motivation. We also see in Simon, number two, ingratitude reacts to Christ with inaccurate evaluation. He reacts to Christ with inaccurate evaluation. Look what it says in verse 37. And behold, a woman of the city who was a sinner, when she learned that he was reclining at table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of ointment. And standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears and wipe them with her hair of, the, of her head and kissed his feet and anointed him with, with ointment. Verse 39, now when the Pharisee had invite, who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what sort of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner." Here's the point. 
Simon was so clueless about what Jesus' real evaluation and what Jesus' real purposes were that when he hears Jesus' message, he doesn't get it, and when he sees Jesus' mission, he doesn't get it. You see, cold religion misses Jesus' message and mission. Had he been listening, had he been looking, he would, maybe would have started to see that Jesus was not gunning for the greatest, most pure person in, in religious society. Jesus was interested in the hurting and the sinful who would come to him. Jesus himself would say, I have come not for those who are healthy, but I have come for those who are sick and in need of a doctor. You see, the doctor of the human heart has a message and a mission. And those who are not interested in the message and the mission of the doctor of the human heart, they wrongly interpret what he's doing. So here in his self-righteousness, he was saying, well, this obviously isn't a prophet of God because he would never let her touch him because in that day and time, the very holy would not lower themselves to this. Just the exact opposite is what the Son of God does. He leaves the glorious halls of heaven, and he comes, Philippians 2 will teach us, and shows us what humility is like. He becomes one of us. And then he goes to the cross, and in Corinthians we see that he becomes our sin. He takes our sin upon his body, which is what we celebrate when his body is broken and his blood is poured out for us. He takes it all upon himself. He doesn't just touch us. He allows us to murder him, lays down his life, becomes dead, and comes to life again that we may live. You see, just... He totally missed it. Number three, we also th see in this text that ingratitude reacts to Christ with inappropriate reception. Inappropriate reception. We, we don't receive Christ as we should. If you're just curious, if you're just looking for a social boost, a little bit of a credit boost with society around you, if, you, if you're just kind of looking at it for all of these other reasons, it, it's, you're not, you're not going to give him the appropriate reception that is due him. You see, detached and aloof attitude, that means no gratitude. And we see that Simon the Pharisee is very detached, and he's very aloof. I mean, notice here what happens. In verse 39, we see that she is, has come to him, and, and she's touching him. He rejects that. Verse 40, Jesus answering to them says, Simon, I have something to say to you. And then he tells the, the parable of the two debtors. But look with me in verse 43. Simon answered, the one, I suppose, for whom he canceled the larger debt. He said to him, you have judged rightly. Then turning toward the woman, here's where we see the indictment. He said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet. But she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. There wasn't even a towel provided. So she has humbled herself to wipe them with my hair, with her hair. And then she anoints my feet with this. Simon, you have not even extended the most basic hospitality. So fill that in. Simon withholds the most basic hospitality. And in fact, you can put below that. It's not, it's not on the outline, but you can just put below that it would be insulting to do this. In fact, the intent to withhold this kind of hospitality in this culture, I mean, this is what you do. Somebody, somebody comes in from the dusty streets of Jerusalem, your servant, someone nearby offers water to wash their feet as they come in. 
You dry their feet. You come and you, you would provide for them basic things. I mean, a dinner, hosted dinner, there would be basic things that would be very clear. And Jesus, that is obviously true because Jesus has pointed it out that you didn't do this. Now, to not do this really can be interpreted as being insulting. You know, some people insult Christ when they reject his sacrifice. They reject his presence. They reject his love. They're maybe intrigued by him a little bit, maybe see somehow, some way, there's something that I can gain from him, but not receiving him as they should. There's an inappropriate reception. Notice the next part. Despite all of our ingratitude, Jesus still deals with us. Jesus still eats, shares, and explains to Simon. That's what he does. He still comes and he is dealing with Simon in the midst of Simon's obnoxious, insulting lack of hospitality. You know, this is the grace of God. You see, we love because he first loved us. We respond to him because he first came to us. This is the way the gospel works, is that God comes and he deals with us even when we have rejected him. This is the beauty of the way God works. Jesus still eats and shares and explains to Simon. He still strives with him. Jesus didn't just get up and leave. We don't know what would happen with Simon later. Perhaps he would come and be convicted for his horrible treatment of Christ and the witness of this woman. Perhaps he would come to understand the gospel, but we don't know. So ingratitude roots from no sense of need, but gratitude, gratitude roots from a deep sense of need, and we see this in the woman's life. The sinful woman models, circle that, those words there, the sinful woman. So you've, model, you've circled at the top, the Simon the Pharisee. Well, now we focus on the sinful woman. The sinful woman models deep felt need for God's grace. She's a sinner and she knows it. You see, he's a sinner and he doesn't know it. Number one, true gratitude expresses itself spontaneously. That's what she does. Thankfulness doesn't have to be pushed. No one is coaxing her to do it. She is doing it spontaneously, readily. No one has planned this except she saw an opportunity and went for it. You see, she came uninvited. Now, that's not, that's not entirely inappropriate. In their culture and in, in time, we would see that, that uh, when there was a dinner happening, it was a, kind of an open affair. There wasn't a lot of ways to close the door and inner city homes and that kind of thing. Everybody's kind of in close and people might be around. We know that people were always around Jesus in large number. He would go somewhere and people would, would often stand outside and hang around. And, and perhaps in the, in the society there, there was, there was a bit of an openness even to the house. In our day and time, if somebody showed up for dinner, uninvited, you would look at him and go, who are you? <laughs> now, I heard about somebody doing that recently in the life of the church. I think the Rivieras and the Carreras showed up at the P Johnsons and said, hey, how you doing? We're here. Everybody was in pajamas. They had a great time, had good Christian fellowship. They, I think that they went to somebody else's house after that and said, you have coffee? And I mean, if you become a member of this church, there's, I mean, it's, I mean, we're pretty... <laughs> Pretty exciting fellowship life here. No telling. I think they said we had like 10 cups of coffee before the morning was over. And we were, when you got a Colombian and a Puerto Rican freaking out with coffee, it gets pretty lively. So. But she comes uninvited. And she comes uninvited. It may be a little bit awkward, but it was allowed. And there she is, spontaneously expressing as only she could do, her gratitude. Number two, this true gratitude, it expresses itself not only spontaneously, but it expresses itself obviously. True gratitude is obvious. Thankfulness is expressed outwardly and freely. It's not 
well, I'm not going to say anything, like we might with other thoughts and other ideas, but true gratitude in itself is in part that because it is expressed and it's obvious. You see, she was deeply moved and wept without shame. She didn't care who saw her weep. In fact, her tears were not hidden and simply wiped away. Her tears were part of her blessing upon the Lord. And they were tears of love and gratitude. You see, it was no longer the tears of shame that a woman with a bad reputation would have. Oh, how forgiveness changes the human heart. How forgiveness flows down into who we are and causes a joy and a relief and a gratitude that we see here in this woman. Number three, true gratitude expresses itself humbly. It's willing to do anything. It's not being prideful. You see, true thankfulness gives back. Thankfulness has no pride or self-promotion. She's not there seeking to get everybody to say, oh, look how thankful she is. She's simply, without saying a word, she comes and she's humbly weeping. And then we see that she wipes his feet with her hair. Now, in that day and time, most women usually had their hair covered. And so, to reveal your hair, much like we see in the Muslim world today, it's not, we always think of that as a sexual thing. It's not always a sexual thing. It's, it's a thing of humility and pride. And so, here she is even willing to to reveal her hair. She's even willing to come and use her hair to wipe away his, his, I mean, who would do that? This is humility. Number four, true gratitude expresses itself sacrificially, and we see that in her life. We see that, that in what she does. Thankfulness gives back gladly and generously. In fact, we will read on Thanksgiving morning a passage of Scripture together that talks about the fact that true gratitude comes and says, dear God in heaven, thank you for your blessings. And because of your blessings, I give cheerfully and gladly as you have given to me. Part of Thanksgiving week is giving. What does it say? Thanks giving. It's not just that saying thanks, but it's giving thanks. It is expressing thanks, and it gives back gladly. Notice what she does in verse 38. She wipes her, his hair, her hair, she wipes her, his feet with her hair, and then she takes the oil of an alabaster bottle and anoints his feet. Now, friends, there's no other way to interpret this except that this is of great cost to her. It it wasn't merely that she washed his feet, but she comes and she does what his host would not do, and she comes and she anoints his feet as both a, a medicinal thing and an honor thing, a hospitality issue, but also a sacrifice. That which was in an alabaster container would be very valuable. We don't know what perfume that is mentioned. We don't know which one that would be. But if it's in alabaster, it's of great worth. You see, when we deeply feel our need for Jesus' grace, we will openly express. When we deeply feel our need for for Jesus' grace, we will openly express our gratitude to him for his grace. Part of the problem is we may not deeply feel. And Jesus' point in all of this is that that is revealing a problem. That is revealing the problem of Simon's heart. Simon is not expressing gratitude to the Lord for coming. Simon is not expressing gratitude to the Lord for his message and his mission. But obviously she got it. 
And she is expressing it with, without bounds. She is expressing it without limitation. So then comes, Jesus makes it very clear, the parable of the two debtors. And the point of the parable of the two debtors is to associate great sin and forgiveness with great love. And so he says to him, there's two debtors, one that, owns, that owes 500 denarii and the other one 50. So one owes 10 times as much, 10 times. And then there they are, they're both forgiven. Well, which one is more grateful? Jesus makes the point that those who are forgiven much are more grateful. Now, friends, this is an important thing for us to see that Jesus is saying that there is no sinner that I cannot forgive. And when a sinner is forgiven, when a sinner comes to the Savior, he rejoices, she rejoices. And listen, all of the people should be glad for that. Instead of standing there and going, oh yeah, we'll see what this guy does. He's really got a past. You know, that can happen in the church. That can happen at Sheridan Hills Baptist Church. That someone comes out of the world from a very hard, difficult, sordid past of sin and comes to find the Savior of Jesus and comes to find all of the forgiveness and all of the filling that their heart has longed for. You know, Sheridan Hills ought to rejoice in that. There is no room for it. Well, let's just keep an eye on them. Friends, we are called to rejoice in this. You see, the parable of the two debtors is told by Jesus to Simon to explain the source of the woman's great expression of love. That's why she did it. It came from his great forgiveness. Her gratitude came from his forgiveness. That's why she was grateful, and that's why she expressed it. You see, the woman's love for Jesus comes from his great forgiveness of her. She loves much because she is forgiven much, and that's the point of the text. She loves him much because she is forgiven much. Simon, in his spiritual blindness, thinks that he hasn't sinned much. And by the standards of the people around him, he probably hadn't. Except that, by the standards of the high king of heaven, pride and arrogance based in religi religiosity can be a greater offense than indulging in the pleasures of the world. In fact, Jesus himself would say that Capernaum would endure a stricter judgment at Judgment Day than Sodom and Gomorrah. And why? Because they rejected the Messiah. They weren't in a city of sodomy. They weren't in a city of great horror and sexual appetite. They weren't in a city of great debauchery. But they were in little old Capernaum. But they still rejected the Messiah. And Jesus said that that is a greater offense. So we need to be careful about our religious attitudes that do not really look at the Savior and look at forgiveness and look at being saved from hell by the grace of God and look at all that he has done. Thus, we rejoice in his forgiveness and we love him more. You know, if you will notice, many, many of the hymns that we sing talk about our sin problem, and they talk about the Savior's action, and then they express gratitude to God. We just sang it. Jesus, thank you. Your blood has washed away my sin. Jesus, thank you. This picture, this picture of our sin and the picture of the Savior. Now, you know, if you find yourself with no gratitude in your heart, I'm very concerned about what that means. Because 
You see, here, look what it says in verse 48. And he said to her, your sins are forgiven. Then those who were at the table with him began to say among themselves, who is this for who even forgives sins? Verse 50, and he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. So it appears that the, the only saved person there is the sinner woman. Everybody else is sitting around the table doubting who Jesus is. She's not. Everyone else is sitting there darting eyes, whispering under their breath, doubting in their pharisaical attitude. And he or she is told by the creator of the universe, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Friends, if you kind of think about this message of gratitude, whether or not you're thankful for your salvation, and you kind of think, I I, I don't really get what the big fuss is, I would say you need to really seriously evaluate whether you know God. People who truly know God see His grace and His forgiveness, and they're, they're never, they're never the same after that. And maybe, maybe this message is for you to help you realize, man, I, I don't seem to understand what the big deal is about the Lord's Supper. I don't understand what the big deal is about giving gratitude to God. I mean, a lot of the hymns we sing, you know, I'm not, I don't really get the message. I would say, well, let us talk to you about that. We want to talk to you about what it means to to truly come and find the forgiveness that only Christ can give. Because saving faith in Jesus produces great love and gratitude toward Him. That's what it does. Notice the last part here. Fill this in, the box at the bottom. So very important. God's great forgiveness is for great sinners. You see, where sin abounds, grace abounds more. That's the God of creation that forgives sinners from sin. And why does he do it? So that they may believe on him and be grateful to him. This is worship. This is, this is what happens when the human heart is saved from itself. When the human heart is saved from sin, the human heart worships in gratitude. And so my question is this morning, what about you? What about you? It would be very, very good for you to really evaluate. Do you have a genuine, deep gratitude for God's forgiveness? This could be the difference between heaven and hell for you. It may be a lack of gratitude. Maybe, maybe you're glad to come to church. Maybe you're glad to hear the message, and you're even glad you kind of like the tune, and you like the folks, and, you know, they're, they're nice. But you start to realize, well, I guess I don't see myself as truly grateful. I mean, I, I, I would say that, but I, maybe I know that my heart is not Friend, I would would call you to consider whether or not you have experienced the great escape, the great escape offered through Christ. So do you have a genuine, deep gratitude for God's forgiveness? I pray so. If you do not, I pray that you will in coming to Christ. Would you stand together with me for prayer?